Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you all can see our presentation, and then we will start with just some quick introductions. So um, welcome to our session on designing authentic assessments. Um, it will be focused on the complex problems learning outcomes as a base. Um, I know that not everyone here in the session is teaching complex problems. Maybe you're interested in doing so in the future, um, but we will be using those learning outcomes as our um, kind of framework for everything we're doing in this authentic assessments session. But I also hope that it'll apply um, to any course that you're working on that includes learning outcomes as the vehicle for that course. It could be in the core curriculum um, or in your discipline. So um, just to introduce ourselves, um, my name is Rebecca Comfort. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the program manager of Complex Problems. Um, I've been working at AU and with this program for about six years. And I'm joined by Adam. Hey there, I'm, I'm, I'm Adam Tomaszewski. I just said that I was delighted by seeing Becca's picture in mine. With, it's gotta be the two most dramatic profile shots you're gonna see in any of these, these presentations. What a good looking couple of people we are. <laughs> Uh, so I'm the faculty director of Complex Problems and University College, and I'm also with the Writing Studies Program, which is housed, as many of you know, in the Department of Literature. Uh, I've been here since 2004. And just to comment off of that, we both look very serious in those photos, but <laughs> what are we 99 of the time we're both smiling, so <laughs> it is what it is. Um, so yeah. Our agenda today is, like I said, we'll be situating this within complex problems, so I will give a brief overview of that program so that you're all aware of where we're coming from. Um, then Adam will lead us through an overview of some of the literature on authentic assessment, what it means, defining it. Um, we'll look at some sample assignments from complex problems courses that we think fit this authentic assessment framework, at least to some extent, um, and specifically looking at how those interact with the learning outcomes. And then we will have some breakout rooms based on the five main learning outcome areas of complex problems to workshop assignment ideas of your own. Um, so with that, I will jump into this description of what complex problems is. So, um, Many of you may be familiar with the AU core. Yesterday, there was also a session led by our colleagues, Brad and Martin, um, about AU core and inquiry-based learning. Um, and Complex Problems is the first year seminar course within the AU core curriculum. So it's a class that all of our first year students need to take. Um, and it's based in this foundations courses that are or it's um, part of all the foundations courses. So they also take the AU experience one and two, they take writing, um, writing studies, communication and information literacy one and quantitative literacy one, all as part of that first year when they come to American University. And the goal of all of these foundations courses first is to equip students to become a community of diverse learners. Um, so all of these courses work together to help students transition into the community that AU is and understanding who our students are, how to interact with each other as peers, how to work with their faculty as well. Um, they also demonstrate the inquiry burst approach that is valued at AU. And this is really key for this session and the complex problem seminar in general. Um, the purpose is really to look at the skills and ability for students to approach problems in an inquiry based manner, as opposed to just learning material and spitting it back out. Um, so we think that this inquiry based approach that we're evaluating throughout the AU core curriculum also ties really well into the authentic assessments that we're going to be talking about in just a minute. And um, this course also really lays the groundwork for subsequent studies. So again, getting students ready to pursue their major, to pursue um, upper level courses, both in the AU core and in their specific fields of study to be able to um, create a capstone project and things like that. So um, Complex Problems, it's a three credit course. And actually I think on the next slide, we have a little more of the kind of basics of what this is. So again, it's part of the first year experience, a three credit course that all students take um, and the focus, again, is on those methods of inquiry that are going to be described by the program's learning outcomes, which I will show you in a second. Um, but just to give you a couple basics of the overview, they're really small classes. 
um, 19 students or less. The idea is that they're seminar based classes. So they're working through all of these different learning outcomes via discussion, inquiry, activities. Um, it should be really active learning classes rather than lecture based. Um, every complex problem seminar is on a unique topic. The faculty have the chance to propose a specific topic that they are particularly interested in exploring and teaching. Um, that is what we would consider something like a complex problem or an enduring question about humanity. Um, and then two other unique aspects of the program is that um, some first year students have the opportunity to take this class in a living learning community, um, which just offers more opportunities to um, incorporate experiential learning and community-based learning within those classes. And every class is supported by a student program leader who is an upper level student um, who joins the class to help mentor the students, provide them resources, help them kind of liaison between the, um, themselves and the faculty member, um, manage their workload, and then also take them off campus for um, co-curricular experiences or even co-curricular experiences that can happen on campus. Um, so they really help facilitate the experiential learning part of the course. Um, before I go into the complex problems learning outcomes, because I want to spend a good amount of time with that, does anyone have any quick questions about what this program is? Okay, great. Um, so since this session is going to be really centered on the complex problems learning outcomes, um, we will look at what skills we're hoping that students learn throughout these seminars. Um, so they're based in five broad categories, uh, diverse perspectives, communication, critical reading, reflection, and integrative learning. And again, all of these courses are on unique special topics. Um, but the idea is that no matter which course they take, the students are exposed to these different skills and these different learning outcomes. We also have really specific skills that we're looking for within each of those categories. So in diverse perspectives, we're hoping that students are exposed to complexity in gray areas, the ability to bring in multiple perspectives when considering an issue, um, awareness of their own positionality and um, identities that might affect the way they understand the topic um, and problem that they're working on, um, and civility in the sense of being able to have difficult discussions with their peers, with their faculty member, the ability to disagree and um, have fruitful discussions within the classroom. Um, communication includes some focus on being able to adjust your communication style for the audience that you're writing for, um, it includes incorporating different sources and also organizing their work. Um, and communication can happen in a variety of ways. This is not necessarily about writing. It can be about writing, but also about speaking, presenting, um, creating infographics and things like that. Um, critical reading, we ask that students work on being able to summarize the main points of an article or reading or photograph, um, anything like that. It can be um, a reading that is not just a scholarly article. We have a lot of different um, variety in the type of reading that we ask our students to do. Um, so summarize the main points of the author. Um, we also ask that they be able to respond individually to their um, what they think the author is trying to say um, and whether they agree or disagree or have some other connection that they wanna to bring to that. Um, and then also that they can put multiple texts in conversation with each other. Uh, in reflection, we have feedback and metacognition, um, which are actually tied pretty closely together in the way we've designed the complex problem seminars. So um, in feedback, the students are expected to give and receive feedback but from their faculty member, peer to peer, um, maybe even with the program leader, that student leader in their class. And then in metacognition, we're asking students to reflect on that type of feedback, to think about what have they learned, um, what is the process of learning now that they've incorporated feedback and maybe made adjustments to the way that they're presenting their work. And then integrative learning. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have an experiential learning component in these classes. Um, and the idea of integrative learning is to connect those experiences to their academic learning. Um, and this is one that ends up really naturally falling into the authentic assessments um, because 
as you'll see, authentic assessments are really about that real world experience. Um, so while integrative learning is kind of the most or one of the most natural ways to get there, and we'll also talk about how incorporating diverse perspectives, communication, critical reading, and reflection can work with authentic assessments. Um, so that's the overview of our learning outcomes. And later on, we will be looking at assignments based on those learning outcomes. And then just to give you a little teaser of how we know that complex problems is really well situated for these authentic assessments, we have a couple of quotes from students about how they connected real world experiences to their complex problems classes. These come from a survey that we did in fall 2021, um, directed by a student and faculty committee working together to assess the complex problems program. So um, that was our collaboration initiative that we did in this survey in 2021. And we asked the question, how has this course helped you to make real world connections to the topic you're studying? And um, we had students provide a really wide range of answers. We had over 700 of them. So if you're interested in answers that are slightly different than the ones we have here, happy to talk through those as well. Um, but I pulled out a couple that I thought really illustrated the idea of authentic assessments. So one student said, we were able to make real world connections through frequently studying and analyzing the news, hearing from guest speakers and taking learning off campus through the assignments that required it. Another student said, I have several times taken the themes we discuss in class outside of class and talked about them with my friends. With one friend outside this class in particular, I have shared and discussed what we talk about in class and it's led to many lengthy conversations that end up getting philosophical. Um, and then another student said, our class discussions not only gave me a deeper understanding of the text we were reading, but helped me relate them to the world around me. Um, so you can already see some of that experiential learning how students are connecting critical reading to um, authenticity in the world that they're actually living in, um, and even just those interactions of social interactions. Um, so I will say also, I didn't include them here, but we had some students say, this class didn't help me make real world connections. It wasn't a huge population, but we did have those answers. And so one of the things that we're hoping for here is to see more authentic assessments and assignments come into these classes so that students can more easily make those connections as we move forward. Um, so I will pass it on to Adam to talk about authentic assessments. Fantastic. Thank you, Becca, very much for all of that. Uh, to give you a sense of, of what my portion, the way that we're going to cover, give you a, the flow of it, uh, I just want to give you some basic definition uh, background on it, because if you're like me, uh, I just first came across this as a phrase um, in a conference that I attended in, in February. And even though the phrase was actually new to me, the definition and what they're going for was something I've been thinking about and even toyed with and variations on. So I'll give you a sense of, of how people are talking about this in the literature, uh, why it works, how it can work, what the benefits of it can be. And then a bit of a deep dive into characteristics uh, about authentic assessment. And this, this article that you can see linked here, um, Authentic Assessment, Creating a Blueprint for Course Design. This is a great uh, article. It's mostly a lit review, but they use that to come up with a model that we'll, we'll get to at the end, a model for working toward authentic assessment. Uh, so Villa Roel, Blocks and Bruna, Bruna and uh, Herrera Seda, they do some really fantastic work at distilling down the articles that uh, had been published and making some sense out of it for us. So I'm gonna use their work to guide this, this part of the conversation. Okay, so at the, the heart of it, what, what does it mean to make uh, uh, assessment authentic? And they say that when it includes realism, contextualization, and problematiz pro problematization, so for realism, how do you go about linking knowledge that they're getting in the classroom with their quote unquote everyday life and work? I know there's there's a presumption in there that, that there's a chasm between knowledge and their everyday life and work. And, but students often see it that way, right? So one of the things that we can help do is link what they're getting in the classroom to show them it's not just contained in these four walls. It's part of a broader life journey that you're on. So that's the realism part. For contextualization, 
Assessments that craft these situations where students can take this knowledge and they get to apply it in analytical and thoughtful ways, right? Where am I going to be using this? What sorts of situations, what contexts, in other words, can I bring this stuff forward? Uh, and then finally, there's this idea of making problems out of it, of, of problematization, invoking a sense that what is learned can be used to solve a problem or meet a need. If you do something like that, students now take a kind of urgency to the knowledge, because again, they get that this is something that's bigger than the classroom. If you get into, and I won't go deep down this road, but those of you that know me, this is a road I like to travel. But if you go deep into the ungrading literature, one of the things that students can quickly sniff out, especially by the time they reach us in higher ed, is busy work. Work that, by for them definition, it's not work that's valuable. Right, And so I think there's a lot to unpack there that we even have this expression that people on both sides of the relationship understand. Students use this idea of, oh, that's just busy work. We understand what they're saying is, I don't see the value in that work. And so authentic assessment is, is trying to meet that particular concern of students, which is a fair concern. What's important about what I'm doing? We all wanna know that. What's important about what I'm doing? Uh, You'll see, I have a little asterisk here. Uh, these are some of the benefits of authentic assessment. And if you're curious, like I am, about what's your support for these claims? This, this article by Villa Royale et al., there are citations for all of these things. And so I just wanted to make it very clear that though I don't list them, uh, these are all supported by different studies. So some of the benefits of moving to authentic assessment. The quality and depth of learning. So students are going to go beyond the superficial, the banking model that Ferrer talks about. They're going to get into the more substantive understanding of knowledge, applying it, and then holding on to it. You're also going to get to help them with higher order, higher order cognitive skills. One of the things we'll look at in a moment are studies that have found that if assessment is used in this authentic way, and especially the feedback side of it, if you start looking at feedback and assessment, not as end goals of a process of learning, but as part of the process of learning itself, there are ways that you can quote unquote test students that in fact help them continue learning. And there are ways of testing students that shut down learning. And we'll talk about that in a little bit coming up. You're also gonna help students feel more independent. They're gonna feel as if they can take control of their own education. They can stand on their own intellectual feet as they learn how to apply knowledge that they know in one place to other places. It's also going to help them believe in why they're doing what they're doing. Their commitment to their own learning, their, their motivation for it will improve with these kind of assessments. All of that is gonna help them self-regulate. The executive skills that they've come to us with and that we can help them continue to develop, this will also impact that in positive ways. And then specifically thinking about the kind of learning outcomes we have, authentic assessments and the things we've talked about that they do, uh, realism, contextualization, problematization, that helps students think about their own thinking and it helps them with the, the cor corollary of self-reflection on that. All right. So that's basically what it is. That is what you can hope to get from it. And now let's dive in to some of these specific characteristics of these three dimensions. Uh, Villa Royale et al., they break these three dimensions down into 12 to 13 uh, smaller elements that are part of authentic assessment. So we can use these as our kind of winnowing tool here, realism, cognitive challenge, and evaluative judgment. These three dimensions hold on to different things that you can bring to your own construction of assignments. So you're probably asking, what makes assessment realistic? Uh, they say two things. If you want to craft a realistic assessment task, one is having some kind of real context. You set up a problem to be solved. You can also have some sort of real quote unquote task, they say, that approaches what people face in real and or professional life. Um, I will say the, the one thing about this article, if you go check this out, which I highly recommend, I love Villa Royale et al.'s article. 
they are very much though painting parts of it through the lens of the professional life after college, looking at what they're doing in these classes, a kind of training for a career. Uh, we will resist that a bit, especially in, in complex problems where what we think of as our classes, we think of them as preparing them for the collegiate life and the collegiate level of thinking about problems from multiple viewpoints, think about your own relationship, the problems, your own viewpoints, what has formed who you are, how you interact with others. Um, and so I, I dialed out some of the focus on the professional life outside of that. But the point stands, right, that a realistic task is going to be something that you can envision students being people out in the real world, doing some sort of challenge, facing some sort of issue that will then to them feel not busy work. This is a real thing I'm going to need to use one day. So how might you do that in a, a con couple of concrete suggestions from the article? Explicitly ask them to apply previous knowledge to new situations and tasks. What have you passed along to them that would in some new context serve them well? How can you get them to do this work? Um, they give some examples. You might ask them to do a, a case analysis. You could have them solve some specific problem. Um, then they also suggest short or extensive essay questions. The trick here is, and as a guy that teaches writing, uh, academic writing for the last 18 years, thinking of it as a proxy of the real world, most people, I'm devastated to learn, don't write essays in their daily lives. And so when we are crafting essays in class, this, this injunction here makes me think, where will they do this kind of work? This long form, this thoroughly vetted, this researched argument work in a place that feels perhaps more authentic than the quote unquote traditional college essay. Um, so the idea that it's a proxy of the real world really gets to authentic assessment because it wants you thinking about your students and what their lives will be like and what might they really do with the kind of knowledge you're giving them? So the next dimension is cognitive challenge. Uh, the, the fundamental question here might be, why should assessment focus on cognitive challenges? In the course of the article from Villaroyal uh, et al., they point to this article uh, by Ralston, Dunlosky, and, and Skiritelli, The Power of Successive Relearning, Improving Performance on Course Exams and Long-Term Retention. This is what I was mentioning earlier that I found particularly fascinating. So what they did is they took memory skills in closed question tests and they compared students who took open answer tests that asked them to engage higher order cognitive abilities. And they looked at that in the short, the medium, and the long term to see how performance was maintained over these three dimensions, the short, medium, and long term. The students who were given assessments that asked them to engage their higher order cognitive abilities held on to that knowledge longer than the students who were given closed question, multiple choice, spit it back and be done. And so it shows that the way that you assess can be part of a feedback learning loop, not just some end goal. Give it to me, spit it back out, move on to the next batch of knowledge. Uh, I was, was preparing this for the last couple of days, and I was telling my eighth grader uh, about this particular idea because she's an eighth grader here in Montgomery County Schools, and they've been taking many of their standardized tests throughout the last couple of weeks, um, and she had a history one coming up, and she said that she fully anticipated forgetting everything she had just learned as soon as she was done with the test. And I said, well, this is exactly what I'm talking about, right? Because that test only wants you to fill in the blank, give a quick answer. It's not asking her to engage complicated higher order cognitive abilities. If you change assessment to do that, you can help your students hold on to their learning for longer. Uh, this is their, their summative review here. Quote, unquote, the, the, uh, the overview of the terms show that the stability is greater in the latter, suggesting that assessing higher order cognitive performance generates a level of learning that lasts over time. And that's what we're shooting for, of course. 
we're, I imagine we're all trying to get our students to hold on to what we give them and help them build on it wherever they go from beyond us. So how might you do this? How can you think about authentic assessments as focusing on cognitive challenges? The article suggests a couple of things. Um, you might think about generating processes of problem solving, uh, application of knowledge and decision making, which correspond to the development of cognitive and metacognitive skills. What sort of assignments might you devise where students have to solve a problem and to do it, they have to do it with some of the knowledge, some of the techniques that you've been working on them building. And at the same time, the students are aware of their role in all of this. And that builds on the cognitive and metacognitive side of things. Uh, these tasks are also gonna ask students to move beyond spitting back info because you want to get them establishing relationships between new ideas and previous knowledge, linking theoretical concepts with everyday experience, deriving conclusions from the analysis of data. So these are some of the things that might nudge you to different kinds of assessments. Uh, finally, the last dimension is the value of judgment, uh, getting into the feedback loops that we've been talking about. So how can assessment be part of fostering evaluative judgments? Um, they say, quote, a recognition that the assessment of student achievement involves both standards, for example, in rubrics, and the practice of judgment. So students who understand what they are out to do and why are in a better place for success on that task. Uh, you can also, this helps students develop criteria and standards about what a good performance means because to go back to the idea of them becoming autonomous, you want them to judge their own performance and be able to regulate their own learning. I tell my students all the time that I, a couple things about teachers. I think most teachers want to make themselves irrelevant to their students. If I can help a student become an autodidact and not need me anymore, then I've helped them on their own path. This kind of focus on evaluative judgment and helping students craft the criteria for evaluation, craft what it means to do well at this. Now, when they start doing that work, they will have some skin in the game because they were part of the decision making about thinking, what is a good essay? What is a good presentation? What would a good solution to this problem even look like? So here, there's an invitation for you to spend some time in class with your students wrestling over things like rubrics, wrestling, wrestling over the ideal elements of an assignment, of a task, getting students to think about, well, why would I do things that way? Why would an audience be looking for that in what I give to them? So the central element for, for Villaroel at all is formative assessment. Give them lots of tasks that let them have lots of different tasks. Oh, there goes my dog. Hold on one sec. <laughs> Leia doesn't like formative assessment. I don't know why. She's a tough dog. These golden ones, I'll tell you what. Um, in addition to many tasks that spread out their work, think about how these tasks are gonna help students understand what quality performances look like and how they can use that to judge their own performances. And then to get them to that level of understanding and judgment, think of how the tasks themselves can help them practice seeking and receiving feedback. In other words, what sort of work can you ask students to, to join you in that involves and necessitates hearing from you, hearing from their peers, and then building upon that, right? Not just like in a writing class, the mere sort of act of, oh, revise this essay later in the semester, but what sort of tasks can you come up with? Can you imagine where feedback is essential to the entire process itself, not just some end game? Uh, they talk about feedback dialogues viewing students as active agents working alongside you to create and use feedback. What would that look like? Um, and as we said before, devise tasks and tests with evaluative criteria. What would it mean, for instance, if you are in a STEM class and you decided to ask the students to write the test with you? What sort of elements of this math class, this chemistry class, this physics class, what sort of elements should they be tested on? 
and how. One of the, the presentations we went to involved the teacher talking about the difference between how a student understood a question that they had written on a math test versus how the student themselves understood it. And they realized that the students understood the question in one way and answered it accordingly. But because that wasn't what the teacher intended to get, it looked like the wrong answer. And if the students and faculty had worked together to craft the test ahead of time, tweaking the language, tweaking the means of assessment, everyone would have been literally on the same page. So that's an exciting, I think, exciting encouragement to you all to think about what can I devise with my students, not just tasks, but even tests that I might use as part of my course. Uh, finally, they say, thus, when evaluative judgment is incorporated into the assessment process, it adds the authenticity by firstly, helping students understand the concept, the concept of teacher quality and what it means for a task to be of, quote, excellence. And secondly, developing the lifelong capability to assess and regulate their learning and performance. That brings us to their model that, that we can use and look at and that will sort of lead us into working together to come up with some possibilities for all of this. So their model you can see uh, is heavy on thinking about the workplace as the authentic building block. How can I devise things for workplaces that my students will be in? That's not quite how we work at CP specifically, AU arguably gener generally. So we came up with a complex problems edition of this. If we start from the learning outcome in question we want to get to, um, and it can be a little bit broader, right? Think about any sort of AU core inquiry-based learning goals. You take that, and then it's step two. How can we begin de devising authentic assessment? You can think about the context that this sort of skill might take place in, where, for instance, if diverse perspectives is our first of our, our five in a row, where are students as people actually likely to need to find diverse perspectives? Where are they going to run into diverse perspectives? Where will they find their own voice as one among many? And then within that idea of that context, what sort of tasks can you do that belongs in that role. That is something that they'll do outside of your four walls anyway, but with the skills that you've been giving them, they can apply it to that specific moment. And then in that moment, what sort of higher order cognitive skills can you bring into it? The third thing to think about, of course, is how are you gonna have the students think about the judgment of that task in question? How can they be part of devising assessment criteria and rubrics? How much can they be engaged in actually designing it with you? Or at the very least, you explicitly talking through how you understand the judgments that you're going to make and the feedback that you're going to provide. So that at the end, when they get formative and ideally sustainable feedback, it works. So let me just take a moment to say what we are going to problematize here with my little question mark, summative feedback. As the article points out, summative feedback is tough to justify on its own merits as the sort of end game of a task. If that's what students think everything's working toward is the final summative feedback, that's what they'll prioritize. Uh, Alfie Cohen says this a lot in, in his research and on grading that whatever you reward someone for, as much as they originally love that original task, they will eventually begin working for the reward. So the two kinds of feedback that you do want to think about are formative feedback, the feedback that students can use to keep a cycle ongoing for the work itself. The work and the process is the goal, not the feedback. This idea of sustainable feedback is, is relatively new in the literature, but it's the idea of giving feedback to students that then helps them understand how to give feedback themselves and to themselves so that they can continue cycles going on even without you. That is our flow chart. And now I'll pass it over to Becca to talk a little bit about some examples. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, oh, we're starting here or am I? Yeah. I'm sure, got it. <laughs> Give me one sec then. Uh, Resharing my screen. 
So um, one thing I want to caveat with a couple of these examples is this idea that I think over time since we've been developing the complex problems program in the AU core, we have been focusing really heavily on asking our faculty to design assessments with the learning outcomes in mind, to design assignments with the learning outcomes in mind. So this process, I would say, step one of this process has been really key throughout. And even step two, um, I think we've had this is where we're really trying to be explicit about defining the rich context and creating these worthwhile authentic tasks. A lot of our faculty have been doing this naturally, um, whether because of the nature of the topic that they're working with or because this is something they wanted to do, um, but not every class includes this already. And then I think steps three and four are really kind of new for us. And Adam, correct me if if you think I'm wrong there, but um, in terms of especially engaging the students with creating those rubrics and um, understanding what it means to have um, an excellent performance on some type of task that they're doing in class, that stuff is more new for us. And we've been working at it from a couple of different angles by talking to our faculty and bringing them into the conversation, but also starting to bring students into the conversation through um, different assessment projects that we're working on for the program overall. Um, so I just kind of want to caveat that these assignments that we'll be looking at really fit into step one and step two, um, and I won't necessarily be able to speak to step three and step four um, based on what we have here. Um, so the first assignment that I pulled out was from a class that unfortunately is no longer offered, but um, our professor Bill Bellows from COGOD um, in fall 2020 invited us to um, see these final presentations from students where they worked on um, a, you know, a real problem using this open innovation process. So I'll read the prompt and then talk a little bit about why I chose this assignment. So in this challenge, the students drew inspiration from open IDEO and conducted secondary and empirical research using open innovation processes to explore an issue of their choosing. They defined the problem, identified personas, assessed the desirability, feasibility, and viability of their ideas, and created di digital representations, quote, prototypes, the stage before a prototype, to gather input and recommendations from people who would use them. We applied project-based learning techniques and dedicated regular portions of class time as lab sessions for exploration and coordination among team members working in breakout rooms. Um, and I gave a couple examples of the projects that students chose. And actually, I think one of the really key things here is that students had the opportunity to choose a project that most interested them. Um, they were not handed a topic and said, you have to do this project, but they had that um, autonomy to make a decision about it. Um, I chose this example particularly to think about how this works with the diverse perspectives learning outcomes um, in this kind of description of what the assignment is. Uh, the professor notes that they have to identify different personas. They have to um, gather input and recommendations from the people who would be affected by this project. And so they're really bringing in multiple perspectives and thinking about how those perspectives might be competing as they um, want to create this solution. Um, and I had the opportunity, luckily, to see the presentation about water access for homeless citizens. And I could see how the students were thinking about like what water access they would need as a person in that situation and bringing in that awareness as well. Um, I think you can also see a lot of other learning outcomes happening in this type of project but I wanted to highlight diverse perspectives here. Um, another assignment that I pulled out was from the Examined Life. Um, this is a seminar that's offered in multiple sections um, frequently, but Professor Marianne Noble had included this assignment in her syllabus, um, which is about, I think most specifically about critical reading. Um, and again, includes some other aspects of the learning outcomes. So, um, in their reading responses, when it's your turn to post, your post should accomplish one of two things. Take a brief passage from our text and expli explicate it, 
or make connections between the ideas that emerge in the text and in your own life, world, or experience with the goal of self-examination. And that's the part that really stuck out to me as making this an authentic assessment. You're not only kind of reciting what the text says or you know, giving an opinion of it, but you're really making that connection to your own life. Um, in doing so, you should plan to organize your ideas around the emergent course themes, insights gained from co-curricular events, current news and events, and more generally, the theme of the exam in life. To explicate a passage, explain what you think the author is saying and why it matters, both in terms of their unfolding arguments and more broadly in your own understanding of the exam in life. When it's your turn to respond, you'll respond in one of two ways, playing the believing game or the doubting game. When you're believing, you should advance the discussion by synthesizing ideas, making connections to other texts, again, bringing in those critical reading learning outcomes really explicitly, um, making connections to other texts, to your experience, to insights gained from co-curricular events, to current news and events, or anything else you see fit. When you're doubting, your goal is not to argue with the author, but to respectfully, respectfully raise relevant questions, even if you agree. Over the course of the semester, you'll practice both in equal measure. And so, Again, I thought this just does a really good job of taking a reading that is academic in nature and asking the students to make the connection to their real world experience. Um, and at the same time, they have this opportunity to make the connections between different texts to summarize what it's saying and to respond to the text. Um, I think this also offers a chance for feedback, student to student feedback and that kind of feedback loop that we were talking about earlier. Another example we pulled out is the multimodal service narrative from um, Professor Chuka's Doing Better at Doing Good seminar. I noted spring 22, but I think this is her assignment, her key assignment um, in almost every semester, they create this service narrative. Um, and her class in particular is a community-based reading, or sorry, a community-based learning class. Um, so they have this opportunity already to be really engaged in an active um, service setting. They're, the students are out volunteering in DC during this class. Um, and I chose this assignment as an example of the communication learning outcomes in complex problems. Um, so I'll read through it and kind of explain where I was coming from there. So. Your final project will be a con contribution to our class's multimodal multi community-based learning journal. This contribution should be multimodal narrative of your experience, such as an essay, podcast, presentation, artwork, web page, or other project that shares your service experience. You're encouraged to integrate elements of your reflection journal, service logs, and service work in any way in this project to create a narrative of your experience. So I think what this, um, what this assignment is really trying to do is allow students to communicate what they what they actually did, what they actually experienced in this volunteer setting that they spent. I think they have somewhere between 20 and 30 service hours throughout the semester. So it's a really significant chunk of time that they spend out volunteering. And this allows the students to think about who am I communicating to? Um, this is a class multimodal journal. So I'm communicating to the other students in my class, my peers, my professor, um, and creating this, uh, being able to integrate sources of their own work, reflection journals that they've already written, service logs that they've already written, but integrating that into a fully organized piece of communication about their experience. Um, so that's the service narrative from Professor Chuka. Um, I chose for the reflection uh, learning outcomes, this oral history project that comes from coming to terms with past violence with Professor Brenda Worth, um, another one that we're hoping to be able to offer the class again soon. Um, so you'll have the chance to design and undertake an oral history project in Washington, DC. The goal of this project is to familiarize yourself with oral history methods, as well as to provide you with the opportunity to learn firsthand about the ethics transmission compilation of testimony. You will, you will be asked to hand in three transcribed pages of the interview and a further two pages of reflection on the process. So I chose this one particularly for metacognition in the sense that the students will be engaging in Washington, D.C., talking to um, 
different individuals about this oral history project um, and having that time to think about like, okay, what did I learn here? How did I interact with those individuals? How did I process what I was learning? And um, writing down how that process went for them. Uh, so again, I think in particular, this, this one really struck me because the students were tasked with identifying individuals to interview in DC. So they're at American University, even in fall 21, when we were just barely in this kind of coming back to in-person classes after COVID, um, students were still asked to authentically integrate themselves with the city and find uh, local people to talk to for this oral history. And then the last example I have, um, I connected to the integrative learning outcome. I don't have the actual language of the assignment, um, but in Kathy Shape's desire class, one of her signature assignments is to have a dating profile analysis. So the students analyze different dating profiles, they create their own, um, thinking about the different elements that are in there and how that fits into this desire, this question of desire and love um, that the seminar is about. And I actually pulled a couple more quotes from that survey that we referenced earlier, because I just thought that they perfectly exemplified how students can um, connect what they did in class to their personal social experience experiences in their lives. So, for example, after we did the dating site project, I spoke to my girlfriends who were looking to hook up with a man at a party. And they mentioned the same things we did when talking about what women's, women seek in short-term relationships. So having that conversation, hearing authentically from their friends what they wanted um, in this relationship that connected directly to what they talked about in class academically. Um, and I've been able to connect experiences from my own life regarding love, sex, and desire to evolution, psychology, and socially constructed influences. Collecting information from a dating site for a project has helped me understand why people, parentheses, don't advertise certain traits when they're looking for different types of relationships. Um, so I thought that, again, just really showcased this connecting experiences with the academic learning that's happening in the classroom. Um, so there's the sample assignments that we brought to you. There are obviously many, many, many assignments in CP. So um, I always appreciate professors being willing to share um, and including these on their syllabi so that we can see what's going on in these classes. Um, so I think now we want to um, go into some breakout rooms. I know we don't have a whole ton of people on the call, but I think we can still um, do as we were planning to and we can adjust if we need to. But basically our idea was that we would have you all choose a breakout room that you want to go to based on the complex problems learning outcomes. So you can choose the learning outcome that's most relevant to you or most interesting to you. And then we want you to think about creating um, an authentic assessment assignment that would uh, start with that learning outcome as its base. Um, Adam, do you have more instructions you want to include for that? I dropped into the chat a link to the chart, which I think could help. And so let's say, for instance, you end up in the, um, oh yeah, we'll share the outcomes again. Let's say you end up in the integrative learning or the diverse perspectives, you can then bring up the, the link to the chart and make, all right, we have step one done. So let's start thinking about context where we're going to use such an outcome, which then get us to what kind of things might people do in those contexts. Um, and we'll also have a link with the, the learning outcomes. Great. Yeah, so I will um, switch back to the slide with the outcomes, and then I will allow you to join a breakout room of your choosing. How, how long do we want to stay in breakout rooms, Adam? What do you think, 10 minutes? Sure. Sounds good. All right, let me slide back here. I was going to try to do it a fancy way, but we're doing it this way. <laughs> Oop, there it is. There you go. Thank you, Brad, also for dropping the link. Um, I also added an image of it to the same link with the assessment model. So coming and going, you're going to run smack dab into learning outcomes. <laughs> All right. 
Let's see. So I'm going to open the breakout rooms. Choose the one you want to go to. If there's not a ton of people in your room, we'll either pop in and join you or see if you want to, to switch once we see what the what the numbers look like. So Whatever floats your boat. Now. We were just saying, as soon as I said the word breakout room, a couple people just dropped the call. <laughs> yeah, we were actually, we were in the middle of an uh, interesting discussion about uh, uh, critical reading and, and make it uh, more of an authentic. Um, I was, I was uh, uh, sharing with the, uh, with the group uh, my struggle with uh, having students compare uh, different uh, readings. And, and, and then uh, one of our participants said, well, well, how does that make what you're doing authentic uh, uh, assessment, which is mm -hmm. a valid point. I guess one way to deal with it is to, uh, uh, and, and that probably would make it uh, relevant and easier to students, is to ask them to relate uh, those readings to, uh, uh, to a real life issue that they are involved in. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I, in terms of, based on kind of the idea of authentic assessment, and I could be misunderstanding what that is, but based on kind of the understanding I have as of now, an essay, you know, more traditional, typical five paragraph type essay, I say five, you know, maybe longer, but it could be authentic if it's the idea of you are teaching them a transferable skill in terms of mm -hmm. understanding, learning how to synthesize information, learning how to do research. Those are skills that they might use outside of the classroom. And yeah, and this, so this is a cool question. Did y'all talk about where? I, think I also was noticing the way you quote text, like what counts as text, are mm. videos text, are TED Talks text, are, um, so I know the, the complex problem seminar that I proposed, we don't really have any course readings, but they're going to be doing a lot of exploration of like policies and, and websites that have a lot of data sets and, and maybe I should be integrating more text but or is is text really brought on purpose because that's more authentic i think i, I think it's exactly right uh, zoe were you gonna say something are you, are you muted zoe i was just thinking that in terms of synthesizing um like one synthesizing text one really easy place to start for me, I, my class that I teach a writing class, but it's on travel. And so um, going to different travel, sort of looking at different destinations on social media and choosing a desk, mm -hmm. sort of taking feedback from different um, sort of ways of marketing a place. So one student was looking at Ukraine and he looked at the tourism, the Bureau of Tourism in Ukraine and the way it advertised it as a destination, which was like, come to our resort. And then at um, sort of a more of like an adventure blogger who was mm. like, follow me into the real Ukraine, you know, and and sort of um, synthesizing those two views into, um, you know, <laughs> where's the where's the real Ukraine there, which, you know, um, but I think sometimes that kind of thing, like using social media to choose a restaurant or like we're always synthesizing yeah. reviews and stuff like that. So that's one thing that occurs to me. Um, also in terms of kind of better sources and not kind of sources that are better versus sources that are necessarily not as good. Mm. Like that is, that is an important skill. Yeah. And, and Laura, you know, you say that and you maybe think of this the first time, now you just reinforced this thought I had, the, the, this good question about, you know, the things that they practice are things they're going to do. And I'm like, all right, when are they going to do that? And I was thinking, you know, if we went back a couple of years and you can envision an assignment that, that said, look at the guidelines about who should get a vaccine and when. Mm. And there were some conflated conflicting guidelines between the CDC and NIH, you know, and, and so if you ask students things like that, like what's going on in the world right now that there are different opinions on, and you, you ask them to come to a decision, and, and like to Zoe's point, the a gentler version is, oh, where should I go on vacation and, and take those things? 
but you can even up the stakes to like, you know, uh, does my grandfather need a booster? And then like, like literally here's, here's a profile of my grandfather. Here are a couple sources on it. And my, so my wife does, does healthcare. So she often is frustrated by the, the dissonance between experts out there. Um, but even having students do that, it goes to your second point, Laura, because then they'd have to not only take disparate voices, but then begin to weigh disparate voices and who is more trustworthy here in this moment? Um, and thinking about that, that great question of what do I want them to do and where will they do this in the world? Two, two exciting things get done by such a task. I think that's really cool ideas. Did you all have anything else that, that came up that you thought was really kind of cool or interesting or problematic? I think I, well, I had posed a question at the start um, to Muhammad about like how people approach integrating all these outcomes and that you kind of look at different aspects of your list of assignments as like the discussion boards are where we do the critical reading, whereas this project is where they're really focused on communication. And, and then we do a reflection at the beginning and end of semester. So there's the reflection. And and they could live separately and that might be helpful, even though some of them will integrate and overlap or is the idea that like, these are all showing up everywhere all the time mm -hmm. <laughs> or a little bit of both. Well, it's interesting, right? Because especially in the, the LOs, you know, communication is one of our five, but in the course of doing certain communications, you may also be doing metacognition as you tell someone about your self-reflection or diverse perspectives well, you have to be a pretty good critical reader to get a hold on some diverse perspectives. And so there's probably a lot of things where ideally, you know, faculty would think, oh, actually, if I look at this assignment, I'm checking a couple of boxes. And then maybe what happens is if you can't, if you if we've talked about course mapping before, we've, we've suggested it. But if you realize, let's say that, you know, I don't really have anywhere in my class where I'm asking students to, this goes back to the, the student testimonies where I'm asking them to explicitly make these real world integrative learning connections. And I've got the other four LOs pretty solid. Well, then how can I ask them to make these connections in ways that seem authentic? I think one of those examples was, I think maybe one of the first ones, Becca, where it was, how does, how does this reading connect to your life, right? And that's getting you to explicitly think about integrating learning into your, your own existence. Um, so yeah, it's my long-winded answer to, I think like you're right, Hannah, I think there's a lot of overlap between assignments. Um, and that's the, the other question, how do faculty go about designing their courses? I, you're, you've got, I think, a closer finger on the pulse. What's your, your experience been with how people go about it? Is it all haphazard or do you find people more methodical? I think, well, we're doing the Course Design Institute right now, which is quite methodical, but... Um... I guess it also depends on for the complex problems outcomes like like I have learning outcomes for the complex problem seminar that are very specific to that content and that topic and then these I'm going to kind of I feel like those are the outcomes that are going to determine my assessments mm -hmm. and then from there I'm going to make sure all of these are represented in those assessments but I, I don't think I would start from these because these are generic and they're meant to be generic. So starting from these won't help you decide on assessments that are specifically aligned with your topic. Well, I might, or, I might push back maybe not. and <laughs> yeah. flip it, right? Like, like for instance, I'm thinking about my evil class, you know, and, and I mean, I've taught it so often, it's pretty well ingrained, but let's say I was coming to a cold, I'm gonna do a refresh. If I didn't have anything planned for the students to do yet, and I thought, all right, well, I know that the Complex Problems Program wants me to get students up to speed on these five outcomes, and one of them is diverse perspectives. Where are students going to run into diverse perspectives on evil? Uh, you know, and, and my, so I use evil Instagrams, like, already, but, you know, social media sites. And so maybe my assignment is something not, not like write an essay that involves these things. But you, I want you to go into, go into the trench, go into the comment section on a tweet or on an Insta thing or on a, a, a public article 
And it will not take long to find someone who bumps into the problem of evil, who blames someone for free choice that says, because you've done something, you deserve to suffer, that points to heaven or hell. Like, it won't be hard to do it. And I want to see you engage with real people based on what you've learned in class. And then just give me a screenshot of the tweet thread or, or send me a link to the tweet. Like, that, I mean, it actually sounds cool out loud. That, that's kind of a cool assignment. Um, you know, and so like, in other words, I could get to something specific to my course, like you said, through the generic, all right, somehow diverse perspectives, I'm going to get to it, but my class is on evil. Where will my kids face evil, diverse perspectives? And now I'm into my course all of a sudden. I think I'm probably a bad example too, because I had a, I had a syllabus and then a, applied it for it to be a complex problem seminar because the department chair said, this should be a complex problem <laughs> <laughs> rather than planning it like this from the start, which I probably would have started with these instead of trying to map them on to something that already exists. Yeah. I wonder um, what you all think about that kind of step three and four that we were talking about, especially step three, I think is one that I'm really interested in. Like once you've maybe designed something that seems like an authentic assessment, how do you involve your students in that evaluative process and criteria and rubrics and things like that? Well, I mean, I guess because they're often will blow off pure workshops and I want them to take them really seriously, I'll have a class where they go over where where we start or I'll open the workshop always by having them. I mean, this is super basic, but just write in their class journal about what is um, useful feedback for them on a That's paper. Great. And um, then we kind of talk about that. and put it up on the board and aim for that. That's fantastic. That's that's what they're talking about. Yeah, because now the students are thinking about what is feedback, what's good feedback, what do I want to get, what do I want to give. That's great. Well, I I discussed the um, each assignment with the students and, and the way they're going to be evaluated. And I ask them if they think that uh, that makes sense. And have they have they given you anything other than oh yeah no it's fine like have they pushed usually back yeah usually they students are programmed to think okay well this is a matter for the professor to decide we're just yeah. gonna take it and we're gonna deal with it. I wonder yeah. if that will be one of the challenges. I mean, yeah. like with ungrading, one of the challenges is getting them out of the mindset that they've been trained well by for twelve years. Mm -hmm. um, but to, would you have to begin? truly from scratch, in other words, right? Like, I wonder if they don't, if they wouldn't trust us, if we said, hey, here's what we want to do in terms of evaluation, what do you think? And I'm, I'm open to you if they think, eh, yeah, I'm sure you are. But if we come in with a blank piece of paper and say, how do you want me to, how should we evaluate this? What makes this good? I'm, I'm going to use it. I wonder if that would do it. I don't know. I've never done this. And I'm excited by hmm. the idea of asking students, what do you think success looks like here and why? That to me is like of, of the whole authentic assessment stuff, like Becca said, the other stuff we've kind of all touched on here and there, but this idea of really bringing students into crafting their own evaluative measurements, I don't know what that's gonna look like. I'm excited. Well, that gives me an idea. I, mean, I, I wanna try this next semester with, uh, uh, with at least one assignment. Hmm. Try to build it together with the students. That'd be I mean, cool. I'll have my own ideas, and then have them actually come up with suggestions and work together in the classroom. Do you mean even building from the, the task itself, not just the evaluation, but even the, the task itself? Well, even the task. I mean, I will just have some uh, outline and then uh, ideas about how to evaluate, but nothing, nothing, um, uh, not even how much would uh, each uh, 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 rubric uh, would be worth uh, and nothing like uh, definitive about what will stay and what will not stay. 
mm. have students uh, uh, work it together and see if that uh, that's going to work, at least with one assignment. Oh, that's cool. And assign, yeah. this was something not this was something that I did as a student and would consider doing as a professor in the right kind of course. One of I know it was something we did. So in one course, it was a homework assignment. Um, in another course, it was something that we did in groups in class, mm -hmm. which was coming up with questions for the final exam. Oh, mm. great. Now, this is one of those, I personally am not a big fan of, you know, sit in a room for three hours and take a test. So it's one of those, but if I was ever, if I was ever in a situation where I absolutely had to do that, that is how I would have some of the questions generated. Because it really I, does. Um, yeah, I, I, to think about the material. Yeah, yeah. I don't give uh, in classroom final exams. I give students online assignment. Tell them you have twenty four hour to uh, uh, to submit it uh, from the day of the uh, of the scheduled exam, and then I tell them if you if you just cover the uh, the relevant reading material, that would be the minimum of what is required. Mm. What is going to get you to the A is uh, how you put the uh, what you learn together, your own insight into it. That's going to take you from the C to a B to an A. Um, and it's tough. It's tougher than just giving a, uh, a sit-in classroom uh, final exam where students rehash knowledge points about the course. You know, and now with this this presentation, the obvious question is, what would the students say if you ask them, what should an A look like? Mm. I wonder, you know? It's, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Instead of telling them uh, yeah. what I just said. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Hannah. I, think I, I tried to pop in way earlier in response to Rebecca's question is, um, when I've done this in the past and it's worked well, I don't think asking students just what does success look like blindly, that actually really stresses them out. But mm -hmm. what we've done is now that we've learned about a concept, let's use what we've learned to build the rubric together. Like we're mm -hmm. basing our rubric off of expert advice and what, what we know is success based on what we've learned, what we've read, what we've talked about. And now we're building an evaluation tool together. Um, so in an education course, for example, like we we learned about what is problem based learning, and then they had to build the rubric to evaluate their own lesson plans aligned with problem based learning. But if I had asked them to do that before they knew what it was, they would be like, "Well, you're the one who you need to evaluate us. Like we don't know how we don't know what success looks like. So maybe in another course, mm -hmm. it's here's some example of." What, what we would regard as successful work or let's decide together what looks what is an example of successful work and now outline what we're seeing in this and then create a rubric from there like this is an successful mark a successful marketing campaign this is a successful mm -hmm. pr memo i don't know what are some other things people do but <laughs> and now we'll outline what's in that and that's our goal yeah, that could work. Like if it was a full semester course, I could definitely see, you know, not kind of you have rubrics for, you know, the it, depending on how many smaller assignments you had, but you know, for the smaller assignments, you create the rubric before the course starts. But then further into the semester, have the students with, okay, you've done the thing, whatever it is, you've read examples of the thing. Now let's create a rubric for the final. Like I could see that working. I I have them sometimes reverse engineer, like do reverse outlines. I mean, because it's writing. So they choose something they already like, and then they do a reverse outline. And I could see developing a rubric from that. That would be, yeah. What's a reverse outline? Um, so they find an essay that they really like. Um, then they do a reverse outline it, of it, which would be like a summary of like a, sort of the content of the paragraph and what it's doing. The content and then they can almost play with putting their own um you know and also think about strengths or features of that article that they would want to have in their own writing um that would require them to find an essay they were really excited about which for some of them would be easier than others but yeah 
or video, I guess, or post. Yeah. All uh, right. Well, unfortunately, it looks like we're coming up right against our time. Um, but this, I'm so grateful that you all hung out here and we got to hang out and talk. This is, as always, thrilling. Interesting discussion. Yeah. yeah very useful. Oh, great. Um, Teddy, is there some bit of wrap up that you need to take care of? Yeah. So I'm just going to quickly share a QR code just to. Um, making it easy for you all to access the evaluation for this session. Um, and I also drop it in the chat here for you all. And yeah, that's all. I mean, that's, that's all on my end. Thank you very much for um, to the presenters for making this such an um, informational and helpful session. It seems like you guys had a really great conversation. Thanks all. And you know, Beck and I, Anything we can do to help, or if you like Muhammad, if you're going to try this out and want to tell us how it went, we would love to hear anything about it. Um, I think this is one of the joys of AU is that there's these pockets of people that support one another and are curious about trying new things out. Um, so whatever we can do to help you on that journey, that's what we're here for. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Becca. Thank you. Thank you.